Selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... As easy as pie? Sure. All you have to do is enter your license plate or VIN. As easy as a stroll in the park. Okay. Then just answer a few questions and you'll get a real offer in seconds. As easy as singing. Why not? Schedule a pickup or drop off and Carvana will pay you that amount right on the spot. As easy as playing guitar. Actually, I find that kind of difficult. But selling your car to Carvana is as easy as... Can be. Visit Carvana.com or download the app to get an instant offer today. Wells Fargo presents one of the surest ways to grow your money. A Wells Fargo CD account where you can earn a 5.00% annual percentage yield on an 11-month term with a minimum opening deposit of $5,000. Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com backslash CD rates to open a CD account and start growing your savings with us. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. Hello, thanks for joining us. This is Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy and space science. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley. Great to have your company again. Coming up in this episode, we will be looking at a really fascinating discovery that dates back something like 10 billion years, and that is, took us a while, didn't it? That is uh, dual quasars that have been found as a result of uh, a galaxy merger. Uh, we're also going to look at a bit of a hotspot on Saturn, uh, and it seems it was self-inflicted, but we'll uh, we'll tell you more about that soon. <laughs> also, uh, Ken wants to know about the Square Kilometre Array. Bear is asking about infrared light, and Richard is um, posing a question about the pressure of the oceans underneath the surfaces of ice moons. Really interesting question, that. All coming up on this edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And joining me to dive into those oceans and many more topics on today's episode is <laughs> Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hello. Wow. What's your name again? A Andrew. Uh, no, it's Dave, isn't it? Wasn't it Dave, Dave for a while? <laughs> I've been called. Yeah, you've got Dave for a while there. <laughs> yeah. It became a running joke. I but, think it um, did, that's right. <laughs> we blocked all those people on social media. So that solved it. Yeah, so I'll fix that, yeah. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm very well. Thank you, asked me that. Uh, very well and uh, very happy to be here again for another episode of Space Knots. Yes, indeed. And uh, it's good to have you here because if I had to do it no. by myself, I'd probably <laughs> just show them the running sheet and say, go and figure it out for yourselves. Yes, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we better get uh, into it straight up because uh, this first story is uh, rather fascinating and one that um, I it dates back a long time. I looked on the calendar. Dual quasars discovered uh, around three billion years after the Big Bang. That's that's going back a ways, and it's uh, been caused by some kind of galaxy merger. So, uh, what was going on way back then, Fred? I know you were there. Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh yes, I remember it well. <laughs> it's actually so. Yeah, three three billion years after the Big Bang is more than ten billion years ago. And yeah. So that's the real triumph of such observations that by using some of the world's great telescopes, and uh, they include in this case the uh, Gemini North Telescope, which is on the island of Hawaii. It's an eight meter class telescope operated by the National Science Foundation, I think, and other organizations in the United States of America, um, that th these uh, that name means you know we we've got a uh, really a really great instance of how powerful these instruments are because you can see back so far in time. You're yeah. looking back uh, ten billion years in time. Well, in fact, more than that. So, what's it all about? Uh, quasars are. Uh, I always call them delinquent galaxies, but it's not that good an explanation because the quasar is the bit in the middle of of a, a young, a teenage galaxy. Um, and it's where a supermassive black hole is voraciously feeding on its surroundings, uh, which is gas, dust and stars, uh, anything else that might stray into its vicinity. And um. as a result, they emit copious amounts of energy. Uh, and in fact, um, when I was a young astronomer back in the 1970s, uh, they were thought to be the brightest sources of 
light in the universe. Um, there are some transient phenomena that actually outshine them now, uh, explosions uh, like colliding neutron stars and things like that, but uh, they nevertheless deliver huge amounts of energy. And it's because of the action of the material swirling around the black hole at their center being excited by friction and electrostatic forces and all the rest of it into a state of frenzy and emit uh, copious quantities of energy, as yeah, I just said. Yeah. So um, why is this uh, a story? Because we, you know, quasars are commonplace. Um, and uh, so are double quasars in today's universe. Sorry, not today's universe, but the recent universe. Quasars, we think, are actually extinct. I was about to ask because I remember yeah. we did talk about that. And yeah. yes, so what we see is long gone, really. It's long, long gone, that's right. Well, it, yeah, long gone in our lifetimes, but probably yeah. not that long gone in the history of the universe. Um, that's right. So uh, the nearest quasar, actually the nearest quasar, I think, is less than a billion light years away. Okay. Uh, so it's it's somewhat less than a billion years look back time. And that must be one of the last ones Ooh. before they became extinct. Um, probably one of the best known uh, is an object called uh, 3C273, which was actually the first quasar to be discovered. Uh, 3C is the third uh, Cambridge radio catalogue. It dates back to the 1950s and 60s, I think. Anyway, um, 3C273, I think, is a bit more than a billion light years away. I can't remember the, the numbers. But that's sort of, um, you know, where they, they they were the last gasps of quasar activity. But yeah. when you look further back in time, uh, you see many, many more. And in particular... Um, if you look back, you know, perhaps three or four billion years, something like that, you will see uh, quasars that are doubled. So you've got basically two supermassive black holes near one another, and it tells you that you've that the galaxies that host those black holes uh, have, have merged or yeah. are in a, a process of merging. You've got to be a bit careful, actually. This is an aside here, Andrew. Uh, you've got to be a bit careful with double quasars because... Um, we uh, again. I remember this very well from the 1970s. Double quasars were found uh, in that period, which were a bit odd because as they changed their brightness, they did it together uh, or with a slight time delay. And it turns oh, wow. out that those double quasars are actually double images of a single quasar ah. uh, that's been gravitationally lensed by yeah. something you can't see in between. Right. Um, so that's that's a different thing. The gravitational gravitationally lensed double quasars um, bent by the gravity of a massive object uh, intervening in space. Yeah. Whereas the ones we're talking about now are re really are double objects. And you can tell that uh, if you look at their spectra, um, you use a spectrograph to break up the light of a quasar into its rainbow colors and look at the barcode of features that you see in that. And um, first of all, you can tell by the fact that those features are different in the two quasars, that you're talking about two real objects. Um, but then you've got to rule out the idea of a possible accidental line of sight alignment, where you've got two quasars which are close to one another in the sky, but aren't actually close to one another in space. Yeah. Uh, so you've also got to measure their redshifts, which is the way of getting the, the third dimension. It's how you get the distance to an object. And so there are... Uh, ones that are known, where well, you've got two different quasars, but they have the same redshift. So the the idea of a colliding galaxies is, is what's happening. That's right. fine. But the reason why this particular story has hit the headlines is that, and it's what you said right at the beginning, this is a pair of quasars in a merging pair of galaxies being observed when the universe was only 3 billion years old. Mm. Uh, and that's going back much, much further in time than we thought uh, would be the case because we thought that at that time uh, there hadn't been long enough for uh, quasars to sort of collide together uh, in the way that they seem to be doing in this particular instance. Um, it's, I, I might just read, uh, this is a press release from Noir Lab, the National Optical and Infrared uh, um, Laboratory at uh, in the United States, it's the NSF's uh, Optical and Infrared Observatories. Uh, the, their press release on this, which by the way, if you want to check it out, it's called Dual Quasars Blaze Bright at the Center of Merging Galaxies. Lovely headline. 
Uh, it starts well, not off talking by... about the two of us then. <laughs> the t- well, you, you know that there could be a there, there could be a metaphor in there for for you and me. I'm sure we'll blaze bright as uh, as long as people listen to us. <laughs> Yeah, um, probably more like the burnt out husks of quite that we are. <laughs> that, yeah, they're, they're um, they are correct though in that um, you've got to go back a long way in time to see us because <laughs> yeah. neither of us, neither of us belong in the twenty twenties. <laughs> well, maybe we do. Well, um, we're here we just you know we, we just, just made didn't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> well, the word fossils comes to mind, but I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> So we, what it's, their, their press release starts off, astronomers using an array of ground and space-based telescopes, including Gemini North on Hawaii, have uncovered a closely bound duo of energetic quasars, the hallmark of a pair of merging galaxies seen when the universe was only three billion years old. This discovery sheds light on the evolution of galaxies at cosmic noon, a period in the history of the universe when galaxies underwent bursts of furious star formation. This merger also represents a system on the verge of becoming a giant elliptical galaxy. Um, So quite a bit to unpack there. Cosmic noon is something that... I I like that term. Yeah, I don't think we've mentioned it before, but it comes up a lot in, you know, when I go to learn discussions about astronomy in conferences and uh, seminars and things like that, cosmic noon is one of the hot topics because it's that period, (coughs) excuse me, when the universe was just a few billion years old, when star formation was at its peak. Uh, so the formation of stars since that cosmic noon has been falling away. It's still going on, yeah. uh, but it's not anywhere near as energetic as it was. And quite interestingly, uh, the, the birth of our own sun is considerably later than that. So we are definitely our sun was formed in the cosmic afternoon oh, right. um, for about 4.57 uh, billion years ago. That's because um, it slept in or had a big night or something. <laughs> had a big night. Well, uh, it may be that it waited around until the interstellar medium was rich enough with elements that were forged in previous generations of stars uh, that gave it enough of the raw material of planets to actually form a solar system. So it uh-huh. might, that sleeping in might have been quite intentional. Yeah, well, it worked out um, for us. Yeah, it did work out for us. That's right. right. (laughs) Um, But the other thing uh, that statement says, the the merger also represents a system on the verge of becoming a giant elliptical galaxy. Uh, Giant elliptical galaxies are um, the the other kind uh, of galaxy. You know, we all tend to think of spiral galaxies, uh, but almost as numerous are galaxies which are the shape of a football, basically, um, but don't have spiral arms. They don't have... um, uh, you know, clouds of gas in them that are forming stars because we think the star formation has completely ended. The, the, yeah. the run out of gas, literally, uh, within the confines. So, uh, as you said, this merger is basically two galaxies uh, whose star formation is taking place violently and there's this energetic stuff going on in the centre with a supermassive black hole. But very soon... Um, this thing will calm down and it will become one of these elliptical galaxies. Yeah. It's what will happen, by the way, Andrew, uh, to the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies in four or five billion years when they collide to become a single object, which has been called uh, Milcomeda, as you and I have discussed yeah. before. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, 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 quasars short lived? Yes, uh, they are, um, which is. Probably why you know we don't find them today. I mean, they're short-lived on timescales much, much longer than human timescales are. Uh. Um, but they will eventually run out of gas, and you know we see that when you look at the distribution of quasars as you look back in time. Yes, they're very active uh, four or five billion years ago. They're they're everywhere, uh, but then they start dwindling off to uh, you know to, to nothing as you get to our present epoch in the universe. Uh, and so that tells you that they don't last forever. Um, the one of the interesting things about them is that they do vary in brightness. I think I think I alluded to that a minute ago. Yeah, which is thought to be due to, you know, just how much stuff is falling into the black hole or falling into the black hole's accretion disk at any one time. Yeah. Um, so um, that is a useful facet because by observing the the way the brightness of a, a quasar varies. 
uh, you can learn a lot about it. In particular, um, it's what told astronomers that, that quasars were very mysterious objects when, when they first started looking at them in the 1970s and 80s. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if you've got something that varies on a time scale of maybe a day, um, what that's telling you is that it's smaller than a light day across because otherwise the light coming from the back of the object will will blur out the, the light from the front. Uh -huh. uh, so variations like that give you a, an upper limit on its size. And a light day is a very small amount of space uh, for the amount of energy that was coming out from them. They yeah. they were thought to be unbelievable at first, and it was eventually black holes that were realized as the culprits for how quasars yeah. work. Have we actually ever seen one? Probably, you know, obviously we can't see them directly, but we can use measurements to detect what they are. Have we have we seen one fizz out? No, I don't think that's uh, ever been seen. No. Uh, you see the variations in brightness, but uh, the fizz out process might take, you know, 10 million years or something like that. So I can, I can wait. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've waited this far, haven't we? So we might as well keep on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, quite a surprise, I suppose, is uh, the fact that these date back so far. That's the yes, uh, that's, that's the really interesting part of the story that um, there are there been around a lot longer than we would have anticipated, I guess. Mm. That's right. Uh, one one caveat here, if uh, anybody does have a look at that uh, dual clay, quasars blaze bright uh, um, press release from Noir Lab, uh, there is a lovely illustration of it, uh, of these two quasars, uh, but it is an artist's impression because we simply don't have the telescopic magnification to see galaxies 10 billion light years away in that detail. It's an artist's impression of what it would look like if you were close up to it. They're very good artists though, aren't they? I Fantastic. Mean, yeah, they... it looks it looks perfectly like a photograph. It uh, does. Which is a bit of a worry because, you know, confusing artist's impressions and photographs uh, uh, or, or, sorry, digital images, I should say, is, uh, yes, it's, um, it's a risk that uh, you take when you put things like that out there. Yeah, I suppose artificial intelligence is now going to um, complicate that even more. Some yeah. of the, some of the things yeah. they've come up with uh, through AI recently have been quite extraordinary. Indeed, it'll yeah. make them look even more like real images. Yeah. <laughs> yes, indeed, absolutely. All right, if you do want to look at that story, you can uh, go to the noirlab.edu website. That's N-O-I-R-L-A-B.edu. Let's take a short break from the show to talk about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, if you are someone who uses your computer or your smart device in a public setting on public Wi-Fi, uh, VPN is a must these days because hackers can easily get in and retrieve information that exposes you uh, to all sorts of problems. Uh, they can get into your bank accounts, your private files, you name it. Uh, so a VPN, a virtual private network, is something that you should de definitely consider, and no one does it better than NordVPN. What's more, as a Space Nuts listener, you get a very special deal, and I'll give you the URL shortly. But don't forget, they do have a money-back guarantee, so it does make sense to uh, to look into getting a, a, a VPN service and a 30-day money-back guarantee certainly does um, mean that they back their uh, software. Now, uh, there are several deals available, and you can uh, get all sorts of different services, not only uh, a VPN. You get um, that, of course. Uh, there's malware protection, tracker and ad blocker protection. You can use their cross-platform password manager, their data breach scanner, uh, you can um, go the extra mile and uh, get uh, one terabyte of cloud storage so you can keep everything you want securely without filling up your hard drive. And next generation file encryption is another one of their products. Now, it de depends which level of service you want to buy, but the higher you go, the cheaper it gets. And at the moment, they're offering an extra four months for free. Uh, doesn't matter which service and which number of services you buy. So check it out at space uh, at nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That'll take you to a page where you can uh, see that they're very widely backed by major organizations. All you have to do to find out more is click get the deal. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. 
and check it out for yourself. I'm using all of their services and I'm very, very happy indeed. Now, back to the show. Roger, you're live right here also. Space Nuts. Okay, Fred, let's move on to our next story, which is uh, this mystery hotspot or band or whatever you want to call it on Saturn. Now, um, they think they might have figured this one out. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Um, it, it is uh, something that um, I wrongly alluded to as a recent discovery, uh, this uh, this hot band, um, which sounds very musical, doesn't it? It does. Uh, yeah. yeah, a really hot band. Anyway, um, in uh, in Saturn's northern hemisphere, uh, because it goes back the di- the, the it, discovery observations go back to the nineteen seventies. Um, what is it? Okay, it is a bar of light. Uh, by that I mean something that uh, is in in a straight line, but uh, quite broad, not not a narrow line. But it goes all the way around the planet Saturn in its mid northern latitudes. Um, so uh, it is a bar of light, but it's particularly special light because it is uh, something called Lyman Alpha light. And what that is, is the light in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, yep. uh, which is emitted by excited hydrogen. So um, that uh, hydrogen that is in that region of Saturn's atmosphere is in a state of excitement uh, which causes it to emit emit this ultraviolet light with a particular wavelength. Uh, it's well in the ultraviolet, so you need to be above the atmosphere to be able to to detect that. Um, so with, with a lot of sunscreen on, <laughs> exactly. That's right. Highly energetic radiation. Wow. Uh, so yes. So um, the mystery has been why it's there, uh, and it goes back. Uh, to, uh, or the, the solution goes back to something that you and I spoke about, I think about two years ago, two or three years ago. I know because I wrote about it in um, Cosmic Chronicles, which I meant to say the other day. Is, uh, it's called uh, Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets in the United States, rather yeah. Cosmic Chronicles. There's a chapter on Saturn in there. Which, where, which reminds me, Fred, we've, we've got a new episode, uh, a, a new segment that we're introducing into the show, and it's called How Many Weeks in a Row Can <laughs> Fred Flog His Book? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, okay, look, there's probably a competition here, isn't there? Because we could have something like that just by substituting Andrew for Fred. <laughs> Although I have to say you've been very... Um, you have been very quiet about your excellent books in the last few I'm weeks. I'm still working on the audio edition of Parallax. The, I'm, I'm more than right, halfway okay. through it. It's just, it's a, it's a slog. Trying to <laughs> record audio books. It's a very long slog. Yeah, I bet it is. I can imagine. And it's a big it's my biggest book in terms of length. And so the it's number gonna of words. probably turn into a, a ten hour audio book when it's finished. Wow. So yeah. this this must have more than a hundred words in it, this book. It, it, it definitely it's does, yes. <laughs> Quite yes. a big one. Yeah. Yes. Um yeah, sorry. I um, was the only the, the reason why I mentioned books is because it lets me date things when we've talked about them. Yeah, uh, because I remember you know what goes into a book is something usually that you and I have talked about. And what we talked about, uh, as noted in Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets, did uh, how many mentions that before? <laughs> uh, it um, it was the rain of material falling on the surface of Mar- sorry Saturn's atmosphere. Boom. from its rings, uh, this phenomenon called ring rain, um, which uh, it, um, I, I do remember writing about this, and that there's, there's two different sorts. There's, there's just stuff that drops down from the rings onto Saturn's equator because the rings are aligned with the equator. But there's other stuff that gets transported, I think, if I remember rightly, by mag- magnetic interactions to the middle latitudes of our Saturn. Uh, so again, it's it's ice falling from the rings, which are essentially falling to pieces. That's the bottom line. The rings are uh, from the inside are actually cascading downwards into Saturn's atmosphere, uh, which implies, of course, that they're temporary. Uh, and in fact, they're thought to be very temporary on the time scale of maybe 100 million years or something like that. Uh, uh, so you've got this ring rain that's fo- sort of focused down onto the mid latitudes of of Saturn, as well as stuff dropping straight down 
uh, towards the equator. Uh, I do remember, sorry, going back in time again, um, the, the old memory kicks in here. Uh, of course, when um, Voyager, uh, no, when Cassini, <laughs> the spacecraft that was in orbit around Saturn, when that flew between the rings and the planet's surface, and it actually basically got rained on. It, it, it collected uh, some of the molecules that were falling from the rings yeah. as it passed through that ring rain. So it was able to measure what they are. There's water in it. Uh, there was other stuff as well, uh, carbon monoxide, I think. Anyway, um, that's all background. Uh, the bottom line is that this story now identifies the ring rain that's going to Mars's mid-latitude as being the reason why this Lyman Alpha bar exists, this uh, visit, highly visible ultraviolet strip around the northern latitudes of Saturn. Yeah. And th there is clearly some interesting chemistry going on there. When the ring rain hits the atmosphere, and Saturn's atmosphere has got a fairly high proportion of hydrogen in it as well, uh, that there's some interaction here that causes it to glow in the ultraviolet. I'm not sure whether the scientists who are working on this um, some of whom come from uh, France, actually, the Institute of Astrophysics in Paris, um, whether they have uh, a absolutely identified the mechanism by which the uh, the the, um, the the Lyman Alpha takes place, but they've they've certainly pinned it down as to being the source of why that Lyman Alpha radiation is there. Yeah, it's a fantastic composite image they've created too on uh, the Science Alert website. It uh... You know, in the ultraviolet spectrum, yes. it looks looks fantastic. It looks like a big, beautiful blue beach ball. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Slightly, slightly flattened because uh, Saturn is the the most oblate uh, object or the most oblate planet in the solar system. That by that I mean it's the most squashed at its poles. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's a lovely image, and you it can is. faintly see the rings as well. Yes, you can. Uh, which and and you say that this has been caused by the ring rain. Would does that tell us what the fate of the rings is going to be in time if they're raining down on to the surface of Saturn? Yep, yep. T uh, tells us that they are dribbling away uh, ah. from the bottom outwards uh, with um, um, that 100 million year or thereabouts time scale that I mentioned a few minutes ago. It's, that's what's likely to do it. The, the, the rings will probably end up looking more like the rings of Jupiter Uranus or Neptune, which are very, very thin and pretty anemic looking compared with Saturn's rings. Yeah. So uh, we're kind of lucky to be in a time frame where we can see what... It, so, so does that also suggest that the rings around the other gas giants were but, much more significant in the past? Maybe so. That's right. Uh, and I think the converse argument, and I think the headline that I remember you latched onto very well was that the rings uh, of Saturn might not have been there when the dinosaurs were alive. Yeah, uh, because they're thought to have only been, you know, created within the last hundred million years or so. Uh, you can't tell any more accurately than that. And of course, the dinosaurs were here until sixty-six million years ago. Uh, but um, yeah, so it's uh, it, it it is. It's uh, we are fortunate uh, to be uh, living on a planet on our planet at a time when we have this pearl of the solar system in our skies. One that. Earth. Anybody can look through a small telescope and say, wow. I've done it. See it. I, yes. My <laughs> I telescope's do it every time. right there. And I took your advice and got myself a 90-degree eyepiece because oh, good one idea. of the frustrating things about it is crunching down at my age to try and look into a 45-degree uh, angle eyepiece. Yeah. And yeah. it's a nightmare. But um, I've, I've got the 90-degree now, so uh, yeah, that makes it a lot easier. Uh, not that I've had much time lately, but uh, I'm going to get back out there and do some observing. I'm I'm still hoping to see the um uh, the, uh, the aurora that uh, yep. have been prominent in the skies in recent times because um yeah they they've been seen as far north as here yes uh -huh. uh, and and some beautiful images uh, being published about those but that's completely beside the point. I was just talking about telescopes, but um, Saturn yeah is is a spectacular thing to look at. Uh, live through a scope, and um, Jupiter too. If you can get it at the right angle, it um, you can you can almost see what's going on with that as well. You can see that it's it's um, most yeah you know, very very colourful. Lots of different reds and oranges and 
um, it, it comes through. It's it's uh, it's beautiful to observe. Sometimes it's just a blink of light, and you can't really make much yeah. out at all. It's yeah, just... it, that's right. On a good night, you, when when particularly when the atmosphere is pretty stable, and you would get that out in Dubbo yeah. um, more than we do here in Sydney. But uh, yes, yeah, to see the cloud. The cloud bands on Jupiter, yeah. which you can with a small telescope. And of course, the other thing to look for with Jupiter is the the four bright moons, which change from night to night. Yeah, and, and they appear as the bright dots sometimes. Bright stars, yeah. yeah, and it yeah. looks, but they're all they're in a they're in a line. They're dead straight line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, um, yeah, great stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I've um, had the grandchildren outside a couple of times to look at the moon, and and you you know they're they're so young and absorbing so much information but you you put the eye on the eyepiece and you've got the moon focused and they just go ah. <laughs> yeah. you know because it's it's so different looking at uh, the yeah. moon through a through yeah. a telescope and uh, it's an extraordinary thing to just you know I, I just i'm mesmerized by it i i've taken so many photos of the moon through the telescope and with uh, a digital camera but uh, yeah, it's it's a, an amazing object. I think we got away from the point, but the hot spot <laughs> on on Saturn is self inflicted by ring rain. By, by ring rain, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So basically, Saturn's dumping on itself. That's what's happening. Yep. It's um, yes. It's a catastrophic ending taking place in slow motion for the rings. Yeah. So it will ultimately have maybe just a remnant thin ring. Yeah. Maybe and so. That'll be that. Or may, could it just all disappear completely? I guess so. Um, mm. uh, there may be, you know, I don't know, there might be a stable region where it's... Because the rings are highly resonant with some of the some of the moons of Saturn. Uh, and some of the moons actually are kind of shepherded um, within the rings. Just, by, just all by gravity. It's marvellous stuff. I mean, Cassini was such an amazing mission uh, in oh, terms yeah. of what we learned about the planet. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and um, well, we'll watch because I think it'll uh, those rings will be gone in a couple of weeks. But uh, <laughs> if you want to um, chase that story up, you can go to the Science Alert website. But they've also published their findings in the Planetary Science Journal. Sure. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, it is time to say goodbye uh, after we have uh, answered some questions. And we will cut straight to the chase. Uh, this is Ken, who is asking about the square kilometre array. Eventually. Hi, Fred and Andrew. Ken from Queensland. Long Queensland, time, sorry. Uh, fan and uh, Patreon supporter. I've got two questions about the SKA. Firstly... Most people know about the actual scopes themselves in Australia and Africa, but uh, could you tell us more about the backing, where all the data is going to be processed and how? And secondly, with the SKA, considering the enormous power it must be using, is it going to be carbon neutral? Thanks for your help. Thank you, Ken. Sorry, I thought you were in WA, but that's where the SKA is. You're in Queensland. Hope all is well. And thank you for being a patron. That is uh, is wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, where will the data be processed? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And of course, it's one of the critical things. When the SKA was first mooted uh, more than 10 years ago, in fact, it's probably more like 20 years ago now, uh, The the it was known then that there were was not anywhere near enough computing power on Earth to deal with what would be coming from this telescope. And so the uh, computational uh, requirements for it have uh, have evolved since it was planned. Uh, some of the some of the data so it's a complex thing. The, 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 the data are actually transmitted around the site on fibers, um, optical fibers. And then they go to uh, a kind of individual processing centers. I'm thinking now particularly of SKA low. Uh, that's the low frequency arm of the square kilometer array, which is what will be in Western Australia. Yeah. Uh, at um, the Murchison Radio Astronomy site, which is uh, now known as in Yarimana Ilgari Bundera, uh, which means sharing sky and stars in the Audrey language. Oh. Lovely stuff. Fabulous. Um, so that... Uh, 
to that site, it has some of the sort of pre-processing uh, c- computing computer power um, actually within the arrays themselves. Remember, you've got arrays of uh, dozens of Christmas trees, yeah. metal Christmas trees, which are spread over eventually something like 75 kilometers. Yeah. Uh, but then they go to um, central sort of um, processing units, which are called correlators. Uh, and But then they go from there to, I think there's a data center in Geraldton, uh, which is the nearest large town. It's on the coast 350 kilometers away, uh, and eventually down to Perth. And the major data processing center there is the Pawsey Computer Center, which is in Perth. I've visited it a couple of times. It's a great place with some extremely impressive machinery in it. Uh, but uh, the other point is that um, the member countries of the SKA will also have what are called regional data centers or regional data centers, uh, which will have their own capabilities for doing this. So uh, you, you can't send all the raw data from the telescope to these things because there's just too much of it. Yeah. So it's got to be sort of reduced at some level. And then it goes to the regional data centers as well as the Pawsey Center. Um, and and that means that you can distribute it to the actual users of the telescope who are in the participating nations. Yeah. I, the, uh, sorry, sorry, go, go on, go on, go on. No, no. no you go. Oh, I was just going to say, I was, I'm looking at some of the photographs uh, from the work and uh, it, uh, the um, Murchison facility looks kind of like a, a metal uh, pine forest. <laughs> it does. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. It's yeah. very, it's a very weird look, but uh, they just look like lots and lots of pine trees made of metal. There are going to be one hundred and thirty-one thousand of those wow. metal pine trees, and at Christmas time, every one of them has to have decorations. Yes, on it, so. yes, and a bauble, a bauble on top. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the other part of uh, Kent's question is a good one. Uh, will yeah. it be carbon neutral? Uh, not quite, uh, but there. That that is the ultimate aim. I think there is a large solar array at, uh, at the observatory at uh, Murchison, um, which I think at the moment provides about a third of their power. I think that's correct. Well, that's pretty um, good. And I think the rest is diesel. Um, so I, I might be wrong there. I'm just kind of remembering things that I've heard uh. while I've been. Uh, um, interacting with SKA people, but it, but it is it, it, the the aim is yes to make it carbon neutral. I mean, if you can't if you can't use solar panels uh, in WA uh, in the Western Desert, there <laughs> you don't have much chance. Although I have to say, the day that I visited that observatory site back in 2018, it absolutely poured down. It yes, was, uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's washed the rust there. off. Certainly washed the rust off me. I can tell you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's an extraordinary facility. And uh, when when's the um, end? Uh, well, the, the commissioning date. Com- when's it? Um, so uh, ultimately, it's the late twenty twenties. Yeah, twenty twenty seven, twenty eight. It it's one of these things that you can you can actually kick things off before it's finished because it's an array. Mm. Um, uh, just let me mention. I may have mentioned this when we spoke last week, Andrew. But uh, there is a virtual reality movie uh, called Beyond the Milky Way, yeah. which effectively takes you to the observatory site uh, and it does it in three dimensions with uh, all the details of what, what it's like there. It's a lovely movie. At the moment, it's showing in Canberra, but I'm sure it will find its way to where Ken is up in Queensland. It's one not to be missed uh, and have a look at if you get the opportunity. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Ken, for your question. Let's uh, now uh, go OS. Um, we're heading to um, Bear Country. I'm pretty sure. I, I, I'm sure he said. I had to listen twice, but I'm sure he said his name was Bear. Hello, this is Bear Hands from Perth, Western Australia. Now, I was taught that light comes into the planet as visible light hits the surface of the Earth, is absorbed, and then reflected as a lower energy infrared which is what causes the greenhouse effect. What happens to the infrared that is directly radiated from the sun? Does it hit the earth and get reflected as a lower energy microwave? Also, if you stand in front of a fire, it's giving off visible and infrared light. Is it giving off other frequencies of light? 
And what is infrared's relationship with the thermal heating of particles from the fire? Does the fire's heat come from infrared or the oscillation of air particles or both? Why do we feel infrared as heat? Is heat just how the human body senses infrared? What I'm asking is essentially how does heat relate to infrared and how does infrared relate to heat? I've wondered about this phenomenon since I was a very little boy. Wow, that's really interesting. I don't think we've ever had a question like that before. Uh, we've talked about light a lot and infrared light and ultraviolet light and, uh, well, everything basically. Uh, but yeah, what, how do we feel infrared light and how do we? How does it transmit? How does it uh, do what it does? Uh, that's a really good a uh, really good question. I'm sorry you've been struggling with it for so long. <laughs> so the, the the last bit is, um, you know, it's more ph physiological than physical. Yeah. The fact that infrared radiation, um, we we can feel it um, by the fact that the radiation hits our hands or face or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and sitting in front of a fire, that's exactly what's happening. Um, uh, and you know the, the the nerve endings in our skin are obviously sensitive to that and react to it in the same way as the retina of the eye is sensitive to the visible light and reacts to it. So there's a physiological process taking place there. But I, I wonder if um, uh, if the the kind of broader answer to these questions is about the spectrum of light, uh, because um, first of all, if you think of sunlight, um, the the sun behaves a bit like something we call a black body and a black body is if you think of something like a lump of iron that's black um, it gets different colors at different temperatures um, so as you heat it up uh, it will be uh, you know it'll be red hot at temperatures in the region of a thousand degrees perhaps you heat it up more it becomes it becomes white hot if you could heat it up even more it would become blue Wow. Uh, and what's happening is that a black body like that lump of iron or whatever it is and the sun, the sun behaves in a similar way, um, it emits a spectrum of light which is like, um, uh, it's just a curve that starts off low in the, in the short wavelength end, rises to a peak and falls away again at the long wavelength end. Yeah. And it's where that peak occurs the peak occurs in a different place depending on the temperature. So for a human being at a temperature of 37, whatever it is, 37.5 or thereabouts Celsius, yeah, we at the peak of our black body curve, which is what that thing is called, is in the infrared. It is actually heat. And you, you know that because if you, you know, you could probably feel the heat from somebody's Body without actually touching them because they're radiating infrared. Yeah. It's at a wavelength of about 10 microns, 10, um, uh, 10 millionths of a meter. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, micrometers, 10 microns. Uh, so uh, 10 thousandths of a millimeter, as it was, uh, as, it, as it is. Um, the I'm just thinking about this because that, that's ridiculous. Anyway, it's 10, 10, 10 micrometers is the right, is the correct answer. Okay. <laughs> I always get, I always get, because we use something called nanometers, which are billionths of a meter yeah. you know, to measure the wavelength of, uh, of visible light. Um, so we're all, uh, uh, one micron is, is very much in the infrared, but uh, 10 microns is what we would call the far infrared. Anyway, that's that's how a human body uh, operates. If you if you heat things up a bit more, the peak of that curve moves downwards in wavelength until eventually it creeps into the red end of the visible light spectrum, and that's oh. when it's red hot. And it if you heat it up even more to about five thousand degrees, that's when it, it becomes white, uh, because the peak of the of the radiation curve is right in the middle of the visible spectrum. So you've got all the spectrum there being emitted, and that, as you know, adds together to make white light. And if you heat it up even more, as you do in stars, it goes blue. So the sun is also a black body emitter. Uh, so not only does it emit uh, white light, it's, it's, it, the peak of its radiation is actually in visible light. 
but there is a tail on either end where it's emitting ultraviolet light, and we know that because that's what makes us sunburned. Yeah, it's also emitting infrared light as well. Uh, so the light from the sun is 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 a mishmash of visible light, ultraviolet, and infrared. Uh, and it's all determined by this strange shape that I've just mentioned. So um, I don't know whether that helps. It means that infrared l- radiation, of course, is fa- falling on the Earth because that's how we feel the warmth of the sun. It's the yeah. direct radiate- radiated heat of the sun. Uh, in a fire, it's the same thing. If you're, if you're uh, sitting in front of a fire and not touching it uh, or not near it, the heat that you feel is infrared radiation, uh, but the convection that the you know the stuff that's being heated up uh, and making the smoke blow away, that is the uh, the convection is the other process or one of the other processes by which heat is transmitted. Uh-huh. Uh, convection's exactly uh, as we, we were just saying is the movement of air molecules. Yeah. Uh, the third way of heat being conducted is actually. Uh, conduction, where you're physically touching something and, and warming it up, coming through it. Yeah, mm. well, I don't trademark. know whether that answers the questions, but probably touched on one or two of his fifty yeah, questions. I think that's more or less what we did. <laughs> but the bottom line is, I've lost my pen here. Let me just go. Find it. <laughs> hey, yeah. I've got one. Oh, thanks, thanks, Andrew. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've got a blue one. You've got a red one. Uh, the um, it's black. Oh, okay, it's black. That's why <laughs> it's, it's black. Why it's in in a red. Yes, anyway. Well, um, <laughs> um, yeah, the pen is prob- probably a black body, so that if you heated it up to the right temperature, it would emit the right wavelength. So, um, yes, it, it means that, yes, the sun is radiating infrared. Um, it, it, as far as I know, um, that energy is not converted into microwaves by the surface of the Earth, which I think was another of the questions. Uh, but never mind that it's uh it's um you know the, the the radiation the heat radiation that we receive directly from from the sun actually just goes into warming up the surface yeah uh, so that's that's still emitting in the infrared uh but a, a much lower wavelengths than microwaves okay hopefully bear that uh got you covered but if we missed anything you're more than welcome to um send us a, a follow-up question and thanks yeah. for uh thanks for getting in touch nice to hear from you now, I've got one more quick one. This one comes from Richard, uh, who's on the sunny coast, I assume, Queensland. Uh, now, he says, uh, good morning, Andrew and Professor Fred. Uh, I'm thinking about the possibility of life on Enceladus and other ice moons. Just a question about uh, pressure in the oceans of these moons and possibly of life. Uh, pressure in our oceans increases by about 1 atm every 10 metres. Uh, Mariana Trench is 11 kil- kilometres deep and the pressure at the bottom is 1100 atm um, yet even down there life prevails Enceladus and Europa are thought to have uh, oceans much much deeper than Earth approximately 40 kilometres and 6 to 150 deep respectively but are tiny compared to Earth and so gravity is much less what sort of pressure is thought to exist in these oceans from just under the ice down to the bottom, do you think this pressure would present a problem for life uh, as we do or don't know it, uh, given that this uh, doesn't seem to be an impediment here? Um, and thanks for the great podcast. Thanks, Richard. Nice question. Love it. Love it. Me too. And I agree with Richard. Um, so and everything he says is correct, that um, you know the, the, uh, the, the oceans are much deeper than ours, but they're, these are tiny objects with, with much lower gravity. So uh, the number of atmospheres of pressure that you've got, that's the ATM bit, is uh, is much lower. Uh, it, it is is probably, com- it's not lower, it's probably comparable with. I'd need to look up uh, these pressures, which oh. I will be able to do uh, offline. Um, and I, I will have a look because they're, they're probably well estimated by knowing what the gravitational pull of Enceladus, for example, is, uh, how much water is there. The other thing that pressurizes the water is the layer of ice on top. Um, oh, yeah, I that, suppose so. That hmm. is, uh, that is uh, seriously thick uh, and, you know, maybe 25 kilometers of ice on top of a uh, a liquid ocean. That might be one of the reasons why it's kept liquid, uh, although there's probably in t- internal heat as well from Enceladus. The uh, it, the last time I looked, the heat budget of Enceladus needed to keep the ocean liquid hadn't 
I don't think being completely accounted for. I think uh. there's still mysteries there. Uh, but yeah, what my the bottom line is that I, I think Richard's right. If if living organisms can exist at the bottom of some of these trenches on the on the oceans of the Earth, which they do, uh, then there's no reason why they shouldn't in some of the depths of the oceans of Enceladus, Europa, and some of the other water worlds that we know are out there. Which reminds me, the other day, some Australian scientists, uh, along with some of their Japanese colleagues, achieved the deepest fish catch in human yeah. history at yeah. over 27,000 feet, and they caught a yeah. snailfish. Ugly yeah, damn the, thing. I Ugly saw the ass. pictures, yeah. It ah. was, yeah, but, you know, if nobody can see you, uh, why, <laughs> why do you need to be beautiful? Yes. yes. Well, uh, unfortunately, the internet fixed that for you and me. But anyway, um, that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Um, but the, I, I suppose the other thing is that um, if life has found a way on those particular moons, um, Europa, Enceladus, and maybe a couple of others, uh, it would adapt to whatever the circumstances are. So it probably wouldn't matter to the life what the ah. conditions are because that's what they've adapted to, just like yeah. we have on Earth. Yeah, that's right. In fact, it's more than adaptation. They'd have to be uh, that environment would have to be a benign one for whatever was whatever life was kicking off there. Yeah. Uh, so you know, the starting conditions are are such as that if you're going to get life, it must be able to survive at those at those depths. Yes, and I suppose one day we'll. Figure it out when we go we and might, have a look. And we might yeah. even find out one day, which will well, be very exciting. What, what's the next mission? Is it Europa Clipper? Is that one? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, they're, they're no, it's Juice. Go. Juice is going before Europa Juice, Clipper. Juice, that's right. Yeah. I knew that. We talked yeah. about that the other day. Uh, okay, Richard, hopefully uh, hopefully we helped. And um, yes, uh, yeah, we don't know, but it's very possible there's life there and it's adapted. If the, if the original recipe was... Um, there to get life kicked off I guess that's the way to put it uh, thanks for your question thanks to everybody who sent questions in and a reminder that if you do have a question for us jump on our website spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io uh, the AMA link at the top will take you to uh, a text based interface or you can send us an audio question if you've got a, a device with a microphone or just the um, uh, tab on the right hand side of the home page which will uh, enable you to send audio questions don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from and have a look around while you're there at all uh, the wonderful uh, links and bits and pieces and uh, Fred's books uh, on our um, <laughs> on our website <laughs> okay, and, Andrew, and Andrew's books as well are they there I've never looked uh, <laughs> dear oh dear uh, Fred we're done thank you so much Great pleasure. Always good. Speak on the next episode of Space Nuts. We will. Uh, that's Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And uh, to Hugh in the studio, uh, he couldn't turn up today because he's uh, decided to have much more fun than being with us by having an eye injection. Oof. Ooh, yow, nasty. Right. Ah, uh, that's macular degeneration for you. Uh, and for me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks again for listening or watching, and we'll catch you on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Bye bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favorite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from bytes.com.